This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 717. This week, we welcome back Dr. David Miller. We're going to talk about how relative humidity affects indoor environments. Uh, And before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. And after the show, check out afterthoughts.iaqradio.com to continue the conversation sponsored by First On Site. IAQ Radio Plus Marquee Sponsor is First On Site Property Restoration at firstonsite.com. IAQ Radio Association Sponsors are ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org. AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at restorationindustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA, at EIA-USA.org. IAQ Radio Industry Sponsors are Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com, TSI Inc. at TSI.com, Tramex Meters at TramexMeters.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Charlie Cassani, Restoration Management Company in Sacramento, California, who was first to identify Dr. Alan Turing as the author of a 1950 paper that discussed how to build intelligent machines and how to test their intelligence, which was a precursor to the development of artificial intelligence. Here's today's IAQ Radio trivia question. Name the most toxic and carcinogenic mycotoxin that has been directly correlated with causing liver cancer in multiple animal species. Back to you, Joe. All right. Today, we've got Professor J. David Miller. Dr. Miller received his secondary education at the University of New Brunswick before studying at the University of Portsmouth in England, where he was also a NATO science postdoctoral fellow. His post-university career started at Agriculture Canada, where he became head of the Fusarium Mycotoxin Program. He also became a professor and NSERC research chair in fungal toxins and allergens at Carleton University in 2000. And in 2020, he was appointed as a distinguished research professor. Welcome back, Dr. Miller. Always great to see you. No, well, it's good to be here again. Hopefully we can entertain the audience for another 45 minutes or so. <laughs> I'm sure you can do that very easily. Um, you know, when, when we talked, you, you, you talked to me about, um, or maybe we emailed back and forth about doing another show and, and, and you came up with the idea that you wanted to talk a little bit about relative humidity and its effects on indoor environments. Um, and, and the effects aren't always just mold. Um, what kind of led you to think that was a topic that was important for our audience? Well, there were, I think there were, two important reasons as we've discussed unfortunately before I I and others have spent a lot of time working on the revisions to the ACGH bioaerosols guide and while that largely focuses on large you know uh, non-industrial workplaces um, uh, but includes schools um, the um, the uh, it it's to struck me how many things that can matter are affected by humidity other than mold uh, or moisture in the air other than mold in terms of safety, occupant, um, health, and and uh, and even in the medium term, addressing a, a building maybe that is maybe not a disaster in terms of water damage, but nonetheless has received uh, uh, you know, some significant dose. 
And then the second sort of prompt is that I've been spending a fair amount of time this fall <clears throat> starting the, to draft a, um, a, a possible update or revision or addition to the to material the AIHA has had on on uh, occupational health and and uh, and uh, infectious uh, viruses. Um, and so I've been you know reviewing rather extensively lessons that we've learned over the last number of pandemics. Um, and uh, and as you'll see when we get to that, our age matters uh, you know for that paradigm too. So it was a series of things, not just uh, the usual discussions we have about mold. Why don't we just jump right into your slides, and, and that'll give us a good background, and then we can do some follow-ups from there. Okay. And I think you have control. Yeah, I believe I do. And by the way, I, I really appreciate you putting these slides together. I know you're a busy guy, but you uh, you spent some time trying to help me educate our audience, and we really well, appreciate I, that. I wouldn't really put it that way. I think that for most things, people kind of know. They just may not know why, or there might be an intuition there. Um, and so the, I, I think probably most of your audience is familiar with the ASHRAE climate map, which basically stops at the 49th parallel. <laughs> um, but there are some folks who live about the 49th uh, parallel that um, that are part of the mix. And, uh, and, and so this is a system, as some people may know, of uh, categorizing climates all over the world. So I just carved out the, the map for basically North and North America, the United States, Canada, and, and Mexico. And, um, and, and the point I wanted to raise initially about this was that uh, we have a, in our one continent, something I often find Europeans don't grasp, a pretty big range of climates from, you know, absolute deserts, um, including in my country, <laughs> it's not just in the US. We, uh, both of our countries uh, have pretty cold polar regions. Uh, and then we've got, uh, you know, hot, steamy, humid <laughs> regions uh, where I live uh, about here. Um, it can be pretty cold in the winter and pretty dang hot and humid in the summer. So, so for those of us who are interested or work on buildings, it, it's always important to remember that your, the climate varies a great deal and that brings with it uh, a number of challenges. But I'll return to that map. Um, and uh, in thinking about humidity, I've always admired this slide from a, co a colleague retired from Canada Mortgage and Housing, Ken Roy, who went out one day and bought a whole bunch of uh, hygrometers. As you can see, it's slightly out of focus at the local, you know, big, you know, the, you know, uh, hardware uh, store, and you don't need the computer or even to have a sharp image to see that they're all over the place. You know, so we try to tell people, uh, including in non-industrial workplaces, but in their homes, to try to keep it, you know, between 40, 50 percent, um, you know, for a bunch of reasons. And 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 yet this is what they mostly have uh, have to work with. So I, I thought about that as well. But I think the, the important thing that everybody needs to keep in mind is that is that the RH in the room, um, in the center of the room, and the RH, in this case, near a window on a coolish day, or if you're in, you know, the deep south of the U.S. in the summer, and your, your, you know, your building is warm or cool, and the, but it's hot outside, then you get these really profound gradients. So, so when people look at a building, including when it's been affected by water, they really, in my view, need to think carefully about about where the temperature, where the humidity or the the risk of condensation or even increased relative humidities 
uh, can occur. So that that's sort of the point of of bringing that up. Uh, and so that's in the center of the room. It's perhaps seems a bit dry, but in the in the window where there could be con condensation, it's it's in that fifty percent range that we'd like to have. Another thing that I, I know that most of your audience knows is that when, uh, you know, building materials, everything uh, absorbs moisture. And um, the absorption and desorption curves um, are have different shapes for every building material. So you can see here's solid pine. Uh, sugar pine and, and southern pine. Um, and uh, then you can see uh, plywood and then fiberboard or was wood. Um, and and you, you don't need to look at those graphs too closely to really see um, that the wood is, is takes a little while for it to absorb water compared to the, to the risk of absorbing water for uh, plywood and wood, and then of course paper, um, it uh, absorbs really quickly uh, once you increase the humidity. Um, and, and, you know, I always think about that um, when I, I consider this image, which was from a building that had suffered a flood in the past. Um, and because the people who were addressing the flood um, didn't see any damage on the outside in particular. They assumed that all was well uh, until some years later people started to complain. Uh, and this is what you got. But, th but the point is, you can see that where it was really wet, that even the wood um, uh, got some damage. And of course, the, the paper face gypsum wallboard uh, had obvious damage on it. Um, uh, and and I use this to make the point that to get wood to grow uh, fungi or especially molds, to raise it to the level of moisture where it'll support actual growth on wood, it's about 15% by weight. But to get that for uh, a paper face chips and wallboard, it's about 0.5% by weight. So I'm, I know people have that intuition. Um, but it, it also allows us to think about uh, the scientific term I know I've used before in our some of our discussions, and that's uh, water activity. So, um, and and I I will raise a little bit about how how that can be useful. So I, I think most people know that the Catonium and Stachybotrys they like really wet. Um, things. They particularly like paper. In nature, these fungi live on, uh, you know, stems of some plants out, out in your backyard there, Joe, or near a stream especially. So we call those high water activity fungi. And then you have fungi like Aspidose uh, glaucus or in that group, which are pretty low um, water activity fungi, and then you have some in between. Um, so a few things about that. <clears throat> um, if uh, in this case, ultimately some samples were taken of the air and I saw the stachybotrys. So there was nothing on the outside. Um, so I told the guys doing the work to go cut some holes in the wall. Had to be some somewhere. And I knew that because I knew that it was a high water activity fungus. And if they didn't see water on the outside, it had to be somewhere on the inside. Um, and, and it follows that can happen right across the board. I'll, I'll comment on Wallenia in a second. I appreciate that. I was just going to ask you something on oh, that. It's a really cool fungus, but I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Okay. So this is one of the drier uh, fungi. So another point I wanted want always people to keep in mind is that, and it probably applied here, um, is that 
um, here's this drier water activity fungus, um, Aspergillus amsulodomi. And you can see these are growth rates. So when it's above, it's in this region and it likes warm, then it, it's growing pretty nippily. But it, it'll grow oh, pretty good at lower water activities and um, lower temperatures. It just takes longer. So if you think about a building like the one that I showed you now a couple of times that had a failure, that didn't necessarily happen any time right after the flood. So it may not have been smells, there may not have been, you know, after it was dried. And at that time they didn't, you know, uh, weren't as aggressively worried about wall cavities as we would do, would now, I think. Um, uh, so basically it happens fairly often that the fungus isn't happy, but it's not unhappy either, which is the point I, I can make about that. So if you, if, you, if you think about moisture and you say, well, it's got to be pretty wet for Spachybotrys. Well, that's true. It does need to be pretty wet for Spachybotrys. But it, it can grow, especially at, at uh, cooler temperatures, under little drier conditions too. It just takes longer. So it's not just the one property of, of water activity. And then the other thing I always like to note about water activity is that if you have a substrate where the nutrients are quite available, in other words, more nutrient rich, um, and that can happen, for example, with uh, um, you know, some surface coating or uh, coatings and treatments on wallboard or, or um, um, once I saw a case of in the Southeast where of the US where the fungus was growing really between the vinyl wall covering and the uh, paper face chips and wallboard, but the glue provided some additional nutrient. So that allowed the fungi to grow under even less happy conditions. And then the last thing, which I, I mentioned to Cliff just as we were starting, is that it turns out that these fungi, while they've been working away in that envelope for about four or five years before it really became obvious that there was a problem to the occupants, um, that as the fungus grows a little bit, it makes chemicals that uh, are hydroscopic. So it's thinking about sugar or salt you leave out in a humid area, it absorbs moisture and uh, like a desiccant. And fungi can do that too. So again, you can get circumstances where you would get um, um, really slow growth. You think the humidity or the moisture was okay, but the fungus is able to capture more. And that's, uh, most of these things aren't necessarily very common as problems. But, but they do arise. So it was just a thought, first thought about, uh, about moisture. So um, the, the second thing I was thinking about was, um, was about uh, in our environments, in offices and schools and, and uh, certainly homes, um, because carpets uh, are pretty common now. They weren't when I was a kid. Uh, really started to ramp up in sales in the 70s in North America. Uh, before that, people had hardwood floors largely and a few area carpets that people would take outside and beat the crap out of them once in a while. Um, and, and what this is, is that, is that we, I was interested to know um, how much effort does someone need to reduce fine particles in the, in the carpets in their, in this case, houses, uh, to reduce it to as low as can be achieved. So what, what we did there was, was uh, we asked for volunteers uh, to have professional cleaners go in their houses for about two months. You might imagine that that wasn't very difficult. Uh, <laughs> please. <laughs> Come and, on in. <laughs> and, and, uh, and these were not troubled homes, they were just, you know, thought to be pretty good homes. And so the cleaner folks like the, you know, the cleaning companies that do home cleaning 
That's their job. They're totally into it. So they went in and, and they we used the the best uh, consumer uh, HEPA equipped vacuum that was available at the time. It's still a very good one. Um, and it, it took between four and six cleanings uh, with an engineer on a stopwatch for every square meter. <laughs> um, uh, uh, cleaning those houses to reduce it as low as can be achieved. Um, and, and that's where all of the contaminants that we get exposed to hang out. And one of them is, is the house dust mice. And uh, not you, Jonathan, but, but when Cliff and Joe and I were kids, this didn't exist in North American homes. Uh, it was to, there weren't carpets, our houses were colder um, because they leaked air prodigiously, they were dry. And so this tropical insect or mite literally didn't occur in North America, was first detected, literally detected, only detected in 69 and, and 1970. And by the time I started to do large scale housing and health uh, studies in, in, in Canada, it was, about a third of the homes in, in the mid 80s to by the mid 90s, it was pretty much every home had one and it causes most of the asthma in North America. So it is something that actually affects us a lot. It, it lives, it's a subtropical creature and it's kissing cousins live in birds nests and in the, in the dust it's living on our skin scales that accumulate there. And, and to go back to the Clappen map, this is an image that we produced in the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology um, um, uh, materials about clinical practice parameters about environmental allergens. And you can see, we won't labor this, it's published and it's open access, that it's a series of questions that, that we recommend uh, physicians ask of their, of their patients. Um, um, as to the risk of whether there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, asthma causing dust mites there. Um, and so you can see it, it, you know, the triggers vary depending on where you live, um, except in the deep south where you're going to have them. Um, and there's some other tropical mites um, there. So uh, this is an example of something that's in Carpets, they need moisture. Um, and, um, and so it's like the same image as the two uh, hygrometers, the one near the window and one in the room, that, um, that uh, and this is in a cool climate, that when the temperature is set down in the night, um, um, you know, the floor cools off under the carpet. Uh, but then when the building is warmed up, the humidity rises in exactly the right place for the dust mites to be happy. And they'll, they'll survive there. Um, and, um, and just to go back to the dust. And then here's the answer to the question about Willemia. And I think uh. this is really, really important so th this is a fungus, Willemia sebi, and there's two other species, uh, one other that occurs in, that was unique to the United States and Canada when it was discovered about 20 years ago, but they're kissing cousins. Um, and this fungus, uh, normally I would have seen it, uh, the fungus growing on maple syrup. If you do maple syrup and if you're in this part of the world, you probably do if you live near New England or or you know, or, a, or like maple syrup on your pancakes or whatnot. Uh, and this fungus is perfectly happy growing in house dust, even though it seems pretty dry. And the most amazing thing to me when we decided to look at it is that as many people in the United States who are atopic, in other words, prone to allergies, that we we found they were allergic to this creature, which I was taught only grew on on salt cod, on high sugar products like maple syrup or fruitcake sometimes, but it turns out to be extremely common in our in our dust. 
um, and uh, as the most common species of penicillium, one you see all the time on building materials. So here's a, here's a fungus living in that dust, um, and um, and perfectly happy to do so and causing a health effect. I just want to go back to this creature, although I've emphasized here homes. It does happen that non-industrial workplaces end up that uh, the source of complaint, initial complaint is house dust mites. Um, it, so it, it does happen. Um, and uh, the late uh, Dr. Phil Mori had a number of really interesting cases of, of um, IQ problems in buildings that had defied everybody's investigation. And so he asked the question, are there, is there a lot of hospice mites there? And the answer is yes. And as I said, a lot of people um, are allergic to them. So they can occur in some office uh, settings as well as school. So I always try to, you know, think about that. In the last images of our now very favorite creature, the COVID vaccine, um, and I, 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 I want to comment that, that it's been known for a very long time that RH in the air affects virus survival. Um, and so this is from 1948, I'd like to say. And so this is polio virus, something that, again, Joe and I would have, and Cliff would have probably been aware of, as at least I was in the first generation of people to get the vaccination. Oh, yeah. Um, Me too. And um, uh, nowadays, we hardly think about it at all. But in both countries, there were epidemics in the 50s and into the 60s until the vaccine uh, really was prevalent. Uh, and this is polio virus, and it, um, it disappears the fastest in the humidities that we like, you know, to manage mold hmm. in that range. And it, it lasts the longest in this case when that humidity is higher. So this is from 1961, I'd like to say. And what you're seeing here is a virus that affects mice. Uh, and the black is where they all died. <laughs> and the white is where they live. So even though it's an old image, of course, this has been done more recently and with more sophisticated um, methods, but it's true pretty much right across the board that both for uh, airborne virus survival and for whether or not you're going to get really sick, if you're too wet or too dry, you're at greater risk. Um, so I, I, I guess, Joe, that I, I, I wanted to raise that for contaminants but but here's a here's a paper that asked the question about about uh, well what about us you know we're the occupants and this is a fairly good it must have been a very expensive study um, where they actually put uh, heart rate monitors um, uh, on 134 people um, which is sort of a proxy for stress. Um, and, and then they looked at RH and temperature. Um, I think everybody understands that when it's too hot and humid, you don't feel good. So, and, and in the earliest days of the IQ game, um, people would go and investigate a building and not really find anything objectively wrong in terms of contaminants, but the environment was uncomfortable. And, you know, I think it's intuitive that when you feel, oh, it's too dry, even though you maybe don't know what that means, or if it's too humid, that you don't like it and it causes a degree of stress. And sure enough, it does. And, uh, and there are some work environments that are high pressure where this effect is stronger. Um, and so, you know, keeping humidity something that I would have probably talked about a few times with you guys over the years, uh, under control for preventing surface fungal growth, for properly up managing mold damage and, and cleaning it up. Um, uh, it affects other contaminants like house dust mites, like the fungi that grow in 
in dust because they can grow there because they're so xerophilic, um, that the fungi can grow and absorb moisture from the air. So the problem may happen very far in the future. And then lastly, I've made the point that RH matters for our own health. And so keeping that, you know, for the community that most often tunes in here, keeping that, there's a, an enormous amount of evidence uh, to make sure that you try to keep in that range uh, as being very beneficial. So as I always say, sorry for the boring lecture. <laughs> uh, the, you know, what we'll do is we're going to stop and thank our sponsors at halftime. And then what we'll do for the whole second half of the show, we're going to do follow-up questions and questions from our audience. So let's stop and thank our sponsors. We'll be back with Dr. Miller in uh, about, about a minute. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site your trusted full-service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org. AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA's Multidisciplinary Membership, collects, generates, and disseminates information concerning environmental and occupational health hazards in the built environment at eia-usa.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, iicrc.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the oldest and largest nonprofit professional trade association dedicated to providing leadership and promoting best practices through advocacy, standards, and professional qualifications for the restoration industry at restorationindustry.org. Industry sponsors are Particles Plus. Feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, particlesplus.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations, TSI.com. Tramex Meters, developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974. Mm -hmm. TramexMeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers. HealthyIndoors.com. All right, we're back with Dr. David Miller. I got a text question I think is a good one. I'm familiar with damp basements. How about what is happening with a duct inside a drywall chase operating during cooling season? Is there evidence of this being a common high relative humidity mold location? Yeah, well, there are in some climates. The answer is yes. And, and after all, this is why... Hmm, 30 years ago, there was an effort to reduce, uh, you know, to change the code to forbid uh, fibrous insulation inside ducts. Remember, it used to be put there, as well as saying fibrous insulation basically in the drip pan of perimeter induction units. And in some of the worst health problems I've encountered in the long past were in, even in residences where you had that type of material. Now, steel ducts, um, they're, I would say that's a non problem. You know, there are occasionally circumstances where you might, you might end up with some growth on a, on a surface that got uh, dirty. Um, um, and, uh, and, and then, uh, I see in the in the Q and A that the uh, Don is asking about uh, Hugler is asking about the chase, and the answer is yes. That I've seen problems like that, and in particularly in hospitals where that can cause a big hairy problem uh, because if it's a heating duct, uh, uh, you know, um, steam uh, pipe chase or something like that, or hot water then any amount of moisture in there can um, 
um, allow the growth of Aspergillus fumigatus, the pathogen that that actually, of course, kills uh, people. Um, but at the same time, it, it it generally is uncommon because you need, you know, I again, I've seen cases of it, but it's uncommon. Let me go back to the Wallamia, Wallamia, uh, yeah, yeah Wallamia. Uh, you know, I've heard from folks like you that it's a very common indoor, very focus, common, and it, it grows at 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 lower water activity, really but low water activities. Yeah. Okay, why do I almost never see it in a spore trap air sample? Uh, yes, but you wouldn't see it. Because I've proven to you that that so the the way that image was created was that sera from humans Americans who were a topic was used to look for allergens and it was abundantly clear that the, a lot of them were allergic to bulimia um, and so um, so let's always remember that. Uh, and I know everybody knows this, that you walk across a, a floor, it matters more in a carpeted floor, that you're surrounded by a cloud of dust, like in, like pig pen in Charlie Brown. And, and we call it the pig pen effect. And, and so that's where your exposure would come. And then the second answer to your question, Joe, is, and it, it's extremely common. There's no ambiguity about that. The humans tell me that, and all of the uh, properly done data tell me that, including the sequence data that's existed for years now, um, is that someone looking at it would need to know what it was. And, um, you know, again, when I started, uh, working in this because of biases in the, especially in the allergy literature, um, people would say that fungi like that didn't occur, but they never actually tested to see if it did. Um, you know, so it takes a lot of specialized expertise to know what is so obvious in what I've shown you. So I, I mean, if you remember that image. Uh, it uh, looks like, you know, like a sort of hyphae, but instead of making a sporulating structure like you're more used to for the ones I showed, Stachybotrys and the Aspergillus, it breaks them into little pieces, and those are the propagules. Okay. So they're more like uh, fragments almost. Which... Right, but they're very, very distinct uh, if someone knows it. But, but it did come as some considerable shock um, and this was Sloan Foundation funded research from the, the Netherlands and from Agriculture Canada in Ottawa, um, uh, when it turned out to be, especially in more northern climates like ours, or where we live, Joe and Cliff, and some in the audience, that, um, that it was exceedingly common. Uh, so it was sort of a a thing that people say, well, I can't be there. It only grows on maple syrup and salt cod, but it does. <laughs> what What about, um, is it harder to, to culture as well? Yes. Okay. So that might be another reason we don't really see it in typical environmental sampling that well, people But you do. have to, you could imagine something that grows on maple syrup. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's very low if it's properly made maple syrup, it's low water activity, it takes a while. But if you see mold on maple syrup, it probably is that. So, so that leads me to worry a little that we've been missing this organism for many, many years. Do you have any advice on how to, um, how to remedy that? That, that? Is there another type? Should we be doing like PCR testing? You know, that's why I, I, I showed the story of the, of the cleaning you know, the dust cleaning. So all of us, all the code back to the 19, to the New York guidelines always advocates uh, cleaning. It's, it was in the original draft Health Canada guidelines. So cleaning the fine particles is going to reduce exposure to the mm -hmm. creatures that are there, which includes the allergens, um, which includes the 
host host mites, which includes the fungus willemia. Um, and and it's very clearly known that that reducing that those fine particles assiduously, uh, that that will lower the exposure in a in a building. So you could imagine much like when Dr. Mori had the case in a particular office setting where the people come in, multiple consultants, still the occupants complained. Um, and he had, you know, he was very well educated, of course. He said, well, maybe we should test for dust mites. And it was, it was, it was, um, you know, that was the problem because there were a few people you know, it's a fair percentage of Americans that are allergic to host dust mites, and there happened to be enough of them in that crowd to, you know, to create uh, occupant complaints that had to be addressed. Um, so there would be, that would happen for Willemia too sometimes. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. I know you've got a couple of questions yeah, that were sent to yeah, you. Yeah, I do. It's from an IEP. It says, there's been a discussion amongst my community about mold inside exterior wall cavities. Is a certain level to be expected? And at what level does it become a problem? Most folks just grab an ear sample using a spore cassette with a wall tube. So any comments uh, on that question? Well, there, you know, in, in thinking about this, there has been some guidance language about it. And, and um, I think the, the, the essence of it is what is the design of the exterior envelope, if that's what you're talking about? Um, how is it, um, you know, of course, what is the risk for water infiltration from either direction? But also, you know, it, what is the degree of a, some kind of physical barrier between you, between the occupied space and the exterior envelope? And then basically you have to think about what you think the risk is. Um, you know, sucking air out of a building envelope. Um, in that image I showed you, which is a real image from a, a big suite of apartments that had a holy crap problem. So it cost a fortune to fix, but it wasn't detected for a long time because it took a while for the signal to accumulate in the settled dust. It took a while for people to recognize that that could be inside, but it wasn't everywhere. So in other words, you could drill the hole in the wrong place. So really the, the guidance uh, for a long time has been really think about the construction of the wall that you're, what the history is, all those questions that you should be asking even you know way before you contemplate a sample. Uh, at least that would be my. So I have seen cases where there was a really bad problem, but the risk management was that okay for here there's quite a bit of barrier, so we have some time to figure out how to engineer a proper fix. In other words, don't ban it. In other circumstances, it was entirely clear that there was a major breaches of the burial to occupied space and something had to be done not tomorrow today. So it does require you to think and not just drill a hole in the wall. Um, next, Cliff. Yeah, next one was uh, from Bob in Maine. Do consumer HEPA filtered air purifiers help maintain or reduce the particulate concentrations? Well, I mean, again, the evidence would be from the manufacturers would be yes. Um, so again, I ask you to think about pig pen. Um, and the real driver there is, is how much fine particles there are in the dust. And aside from that study that I showed, there are also studies that were done in Seattle uh, where people intervened um, in the homes of asthmatic patients who were showing too, up too often in emergency. And they were able to show that we got, without changing other things, because they were, uh, let's just say, low-income housing, that by reducing the fine particles, they, it had a big a benefit on the, um, uh, on the emergency emissions of the kids. And this is all published. It's not, 
not um, you know anything novel. Uh, but I think that the 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 important thing about any kind of filtration, room filtration, or sampling is is if the room is undisturbed, the picture is going to be different than when people you know are walking across the floor or or you know doing something like that. And there's a really elegant study that was done um, um, uh, by a um, um, researcher at one of the state universities in New York and an Australian researcher, an allergy researcher, um, where they actually use personal samplers for a whole day to see where, your, where their exposure to particulates and dust mites occur and through the whole day. So they could parse it out to at home when they were on the public transit, when they were in their office buildings. And, and it's entirely a function of, of what the dust burdens were and what the load is. So to go back to the narrow question about do um, air filters work? In theory, they should, but there's essentially little clinical evidence for people say that our allergy suffers. Uh, but, uh, but I've tried to also convey that doing that kind of experiment would be hard. So the first principles is lower the fine particles as much as you can. Uh, Dr. Miller, let me, let's go back to the uh, HEPA vacuuming study. And I don't know yeah. if we could pull that slide up or not, but um, what was the type of HEPA vacuum? You mentioned that it was still available. I I know I wouldn't want to comment on that, but it okay. was, it was a, a one that is available. You may remember at that time, the EPA had published uh, some studies of, of the performance of good quality HEPAVAX. Um, it's um, it's um, um, uh, and there are studies where people have used research grade, um, uh, you know, for using collecting dust samples, really expensive ones, but, but this, ones, as I recall, they cost about $800, as I recall. Okay. Um, that, um, uh, that it was more a question of, of it was a good one, um, you know, not the cheapest, not one that cost $5,000. Um, and then it was, um, uh, but it was also assiduously used. Well, that's, that's my follow-up. Now, I'm looking at this chart, and it looks like after um, three, four cleanings, four you start cleanings to... the statistics, yeah. Yeah. Now, if I'm doing a project, and I'm a consultant or a, a restoration contractor, and I'm working in a room with carpeting, and this home has been through whatever kind of water damage, there's been some contamination, but it's not a main area, and I'm just trying to... Um, get that background level down in the carpet, what would you recommend? Would, would, would I say, okay, in my specification, I want you to HEPA vacuum this room three times at this rate of speed. Is there some general um, rule of thumb we could give people on that? Well, I think, I think, um, so why this got done in the late Virginia Solaris, there's some Canadians on the group who worked with her too. Uh, and I and an engineer worked on this. Um, is that I already shared with you that there was evidence that that when dust was reduced to as low as it could be achieved, that it reduced asthma emissions. So that was a very particular um, interest. Like what would it take? And in fact, another slide in the paper is shows that the, the houses were chosen, not I'll answer your question, uh, chosen uh, for people who didn't have uh, pets. But in one sampling, a signal that we know comes from pets, dogs mainly, suddenly skyrocketed. Um, and mm -hmm. it turned out that the family was taking their daughter's dog in while they were away for a couple of days. So, so what that teaches you is that, is that the dust is a powerful reservoir, even for very short term things. And, and it, you know, I think when I, it's kind of 
I hate to use the word, the A word, asbestos, but but if the contamination has been enough that it was relevant for health, which is my theme here, then then you really should prove that you've lowered it to essentially as low as can be achieved. Um, and how many times that gets done depends on how careful you are. I mentioned that these were professional cleaners. They love doing this project because it's what they do. And there was a professional engineer making sure that for every square meter, they did the same amount of time, uh, essentially each of the cleaning so that we could get a rigorous answer to the question. Gotcha. Hey, David, um, yeah, I think the one thing that was unclear to me in that particular study was that this vacuuming was done sometime after, I, I suspect, professional carpet cleaning. And no, just, no, no, this was these were just houses that, that were normally maintained by the occupants. Okay. Um, and uh, with whatever vacuum cleaner they had uh, that didn't have a known IQ problem. Uh, and and I do want to emphasize, Cliff, that these are not and, you know, the same picture was seen in the data from the study that was done in Seattle, uh, you know, and in earlier studies that were done also in California, I think. Well, I, I guess what my question is, 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 is rather than just uh, HEPA vacuuming it, I'm just wondering whether hot water extraction cleaning, um, you know, would have, would have been better because it's... Uh, you know, it's going to remove particulate, plus it's yeah. going to remove, you yeah. know, soils and greases and well, some other things as well. Yeah, I think that's that's possibly true. But, but the image here is that most of the time we don't normally want to do that. Um, and, you know, I think all the agencies recommend people, if they have carpets, to, you know, carefully address the fine particles. Because bear in mind, although I've talked about biological things, I didn't mention endotoxin, that's where your exposure to endotoxin comes from, mostly. Um, you're in many parts of North America, cities, your exposure to outdoor air particulates also comes from the carpet reservoir. So your exposure is, especially in older inner city areas where there's a lot of um, you know, traffic or or transit systems that are emitting particles. Um, it's in the air, sure, but uh, outdoor air pollution has fallen every year in North America since 1978. But but and that has resulted in the fact that your exposure tends to be higher as it in the accumulated material indoors. So I don't have a an opinion about cleaning except that. This what we're talking about are practical things that that can make a difference for occupants for most office buildings, most certainly schools that if they have carpets. Hey, I wonder um, you you've mentioned mold, viruses, mites. What about bacteria and endotoxin? Does relative humidity have an effect on the amount of those uh, problems in homes? Uh, the short answer would be no. You're, you know, endotoxin comes um, most of the time, although unfortunately I've just had a paper published where the one exception has occurred. Most of the time today, it would come from outdoor air uh, because the dust blow, the soil blows into the air. Okay. Uh, pets bring it in. Uh, if you have a wood stove and you bring rather too much wood indoors, which I don't advise, um, but, it, you know, the wood is has got dirt on it. Um, so uh, a wood heat is a, is a signal for endotoxin. Um, and it turns out that secondhand cigarette smoke is full of endotoxin as well. So mm -hmm. in a high smoking house, I guess, you would... Uh, you would see endotoxin that comes from from uh, from secondhand cigarette smoke. So uh, in the olden olden days, 
uh, when there were old fashioned humidifiers in HVAC buildings, mm -hmm. um, uh, you would often get disasters of endotoxin um, because it would grow in, a, in that. They also do grow in humidifiers. Uh, if people have an old fashioned humidifier with a water reservoir, they just could be endotoxin heaven and sometimes even fungal heaven. But I think most people that would have to prove to themselves they really need to humidify a space um, are, um, are using you know, the more modern type that aren't prone to, to, to that as a risk. And, and I, I've probably talked about it in the ACGH mythical bioaerosols guide <laughs> revision. There's quite a bit of discussion there. Uh, because the tricky bit, Joe, about endotoxin is that although we call them by the same name, there's a, hundreds of different chemicals. And so the potency in terms of human health effect actually varies by a couple of orders of magnitude. But endotoxin is a very important variable. And going back to my dust, dust mite, if, there, if there's dust mites there and there's more versus less endotoxin, it takes less dust mite to elicit a symptom. Uh, so you, it has a very big effect on allergens. All right, we're, we're running low on time. Cliff, I want to make sure I get, do you have any questions that you saw? I wasn't able to follow the chat as close as I would like. Um, any questions from there that you'd like to make sure we get in? The comment was uh, that stakeholders, uh, you know, need to know through measurement what they're looking for. And I just thought that it was just really an excellent point because, uh, you know, you, you have to have some idea what you're looking for in order to test for it, in order to inspect for it, and and uh, so on and so forth. I just thought it was an important point. I've got two quick questions. Um, one is there was a comment or a question, does the – Target range for relative humidity and water activity vary depending on climate zone where the building is located. My other question is, what about intermittent high relative humidity versus prolonged relative humidity? Um, how do the corresponding issues or contaminants um, respond to the difference between intermittent and long-term relative humidity? Yeah, so intermittent works for all of the creatures I've discussed. It just takes longer. And okay. what happens is that the, that is a variable in terms of which, if we're thinking about fungi, which fungi will win? Because some are more tolerant to those dry periods than others. House dust mites laugh <laughs> yeah. at dry periods. They're just waiting for the next happy time and then they're going to start making uh, uh, allergen to beat the band. Um, uh, and ditto the fungus I showed you that likes to grow in house dust. Uh, will leave me totally happy if there's no moisture, even for a long, long time. So. Well, and I think that's another reason to emphasize that people doing this type of work should focus more on dust mites. They're not going, a dry period is not going to make them go away or die. No, and I, I, I flag the, the clinical practice parameter, which is open access. It, it's got some pretty practical information. But I think for most IQ investigators, the lesson that Dr. Mori learned, which is sometimes it's a problem in buildings like non-industrial workplaces, um, and no one had ever tested it. So when you get to the bottom of your decision tree, people are still complaining, you don't see anything obvious, then you have to start to think about, well, what are the less obvious things that I should start to, to, to think about? All right, Cliff, I just have one final usual question. David, anything that we missed that you'd like to add? I, well, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, great job and an important topic. Well, it's I know it was a bit didactic, but for the reasons I said, all of the thinking about working on these guidance documents has reminded me that let's remind ourselves that this is more than mold. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Any, any thoughts on when the bioaerosols book might 
actually appear? Is it 2024? Let's just say 2024. How's that? Well, I saw, I think, uh, Jack Springsteen <laughs> in the list, but he, he, uh, he uh, I, I, yes, it will be 2024. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's say before we shuffle off this mortal coin. <laughs> <laughs> David, uh, I want to thank Dr. David Miller. Always a great, always a pleasure to have you on the show and, and chat before and after the show as well. I uh, I appreciate your taking the time to help help us uh, educate our, our audience. Uh, I want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick. John, you got to have faith, always doing a great job at the controls, our sponsors, our growing audience. Uh, next week, by the way, we've got Paul Wargaki. He's going to join us again next week. Uh, it's been quite a while since we talked to Paul. Looking forward to it. I saw him at Chemistry of the Indoor Environments, and uh, we made sure that we got a date together. So next Friday at noon, please come join us for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. 